All right, so welcome back everyone to the second half of the morning session, which will begin with the talk by Samuel Abreu on the two loop or graviton scattering amplitude. So hi everyone, and thanks for uh, the organizers for the opportunity to give a, a talk at this conference, uh, which is a bit different than usual. So um, I will talk about this uh, uh, two loop for graviton scattering amplitude calculation that we did uh, well, essentially with the Freiburg group that uh, Alex uh, mentioned in the previous talk um, and which we published in this paper uh, here. Uh, okay. So let me start with the motivation for why we wanted to look at this amplitude. Um, the main motivation was to compute an important amplitude in, uh, in pure uh, gravity. So I, I, I will co consider an amplitude with just uh, graviton, so no matter uh, state. Um, the old plus amplitude was known, so we wanted to compute the remaining uh, elicities. Also, the UV was well studied, but uh, less was known about the, the finite pieces. Um, th this, this, this particular calculation also gave new insights into the relation between multi-loop amplitudes and uh, uh, classical gravitational dynamics. And for this, I refer you to Julius' talk on, uh, on Tuesday. And uh, by doing this calculation, we, want to, we also wanted to develop the tools to compute gravity amplitudes and also explore uh, the, the framework that we've been developed to look numerical linearity beyond just planar uh, QCD. So let me start by defining the calculation that we, that we wanted to do. So as, as is well known, the, the einstein hilbert lagrangian is non-renormalizable, so uh, you need to start including counter terms as you go to uh, higher loop orders. So if you do a one loop calculation, you need to include this gauss counter counterterm, which uh, turns out to be evanescent, but uh, does contribute at, at two loops. And when you go to two loops, you have a new counterterm, these R cubed uh, counterterms. And uh, if you go to higher loops, you would have even more uh, counterterms. And I refer you here to Emil's talk also on Tuesday, where, where he described this sort of uh, Lagrangians in, in great detail. So just to be clear, by two loops, I should explain what I mean by two loops. By two loops, I'm referring to the order of the calculation in the Einstein-Hilbert part of the Lagrangian. Um, and uh, so it also involves parts that are not uh, uh, two-loop calculations. Um, you can see this, for instance, by looking at the order of the vertices of each, in each of the different uh, terms of the Lagrangian. So this is order kappa to the sixth. But so is uh, these type of diagrams where you have a true level diagrams with a single R cubed vertex and uh, or a one loop uh, diagram with a single gauss one insertion or a tree diagram with two gauss one insertions. So uh, the, the consistent calculation for a two loop uh, einstein hilbert contribution is to include all these contributions that are order kappa to the sixth or uh, cubic in the Newton's uh, constant. So this is what we will compute in this, in this talk. Okay, so it's not, in principle, it should not be a difficult amplitude to compute because it only depends on, uh, I mean, it's, it's a two to two process with only massless particles, so you would think it's not that hard. Uh, so let me just highlight the two main challenges. The first one is that uh, einstein hilbert feynman rules are complicated. So I just listed here. So you, you know that as you increase the multiplicity, you get more and more uh, Feynman rules. And so a Feynman uh, diagram based calculation is completely out of the question. And uh, of course, we turn to uh, generalized unitarity to solve this problem. Uh, another issue is that the einstein interactions have high power counting. Um, so this is the power counting of a QCD calculation, where if you have a, a three, three gluon vertex, you get a single power of the loop momentum in your numerator. Whereas if you do a gravity calculation, you can get the momentum squared. This means that, in practice, this means that the, the integrand will be complicated and that you would want to avoid even having to and to construct the analytic form of the integrand. And in our approach, the idea is that we, we never do this. We just get the analytics of the, of the final amplitude, the integrated amplitude from numerical uh, calculations. Uh, so in summary, both these uh, challenges are addressed by our approach the to loop numerical unitarity, which we've implemented in this uh, automated framework called Caraval that we will be releasing uh, soon. Okay, so let me be clear about what we mean by computing an amplitude. So by computing an amplitude, we mean we compute it in D dimensions. So D is four minus two epsilon. And we mean achieving this decomposition of the amplitude where you have uh, coefficients that are uh, rational functions, essentially of the variables that they depend on and, um, and some master integrals. So we want to compute this decomposition to master integrals. For this particular calculation, the master integrals are really not a problem. They've been known for, for 20 years. 
So, so they're not a problem to compute this amplitude, and the talk will be. I'll, I will focus on the calculation of the of the coefficients. So I will describe our approach to this uh, to this problem, and our idea is that you promote this decomposition of the amplitude to uh, of the integrated amplitude to a decomposition of the integrand, and the price you need to pay is that you need to new to introduce a new type of terms which we call uh, surface terms. So these are terms that if I integrate, they would integrate to zero. But when I when I write the integrand, they should they should be there. Um, so some comments on this uh, on this decomposition. First, the dimension of uh, this space is simple to determine um, at any local border, but in particular for, for, for this calculation, and it's um, um, power counting uh, specific, so theory specific. Um, so the steps in, in achieving these decompositions will be to first construct the surface terms and then, uh, and then computing these coefficients. And so once, once we've computed these coefficients, integrating the amplitude and obtaining this form is simply setting to zero the surface terms. Okay, so uh, let me discuss the surface terms how we, and how we constructed them. So the idea is that for each uh, gamma, and gamma here denotes a set of propagators, so it denotes one of these pictures here. So these pictures are not Feynman diagrams, they're just, they're just denoting a set of propagators. So for each gamma, I want to construct numerators such that if I compute this integral, I get zero. If I, if I get something like that, then I've built a surface term. And we know how to do that in general. We know that uh, this, this, uh, this is the well-known integration by parts relation, so we know how to do this. Now, particularly in the gravity calculation, as I said earlier, the integrand is very complicated. You have high uh, um, powers of the loop momentum in the numerator, so you want to avoid in this process to generate new structures, new propagated structures, which you would do for, a, for an arbitrary choice of, uh, of vector u here, when, when the derivative acts on the propagators, you would, you would increase the power of the propagators. And so you would generate new propagator structures when you build these IBP relations. And so you would have a bigger uh, linear system to solve in the end. So we put a restriction on these vectors that they should not increase the propagator power. So you can, you can make this formal by, by, by this equation. And this was introduced by these people uh, some years ago. And um, so solving this Right, this, this problem, what we call so these IBP generating vectors, such that they satisfy this property, is equivalent to solving uh, CCG equations. And uh, so we, we've been doing this for a while already, and there's also other groups that, that follow this, uh, this approach. Okay, so now let's assume that you've built a full set of IBP generating vectors. Now, if you, wanna, uh, if you want to construct a surface term, all you, need, all you need to do is multiply it by some polynomial or some monomial in the, in the, in the, in the loop momentum component and you directly get a surface term of, of this form simply, simply by putting, oh, can you see my screen? It's bouncing around uh, somehow, but go ahead. Okay, it's also bouncing. Let me just try to close it and start again, maybe. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we build these surface terms and then, um, okay, so once we have built uh, a, a large number of surface terms, it's a linear algebra problem to, to, to classify which ones are independent and which ones are not. And this gives us the dimension of the uh, surface terms function space from which we can infer the dimension of the master interval uh, function space. Um, so just to be more, more, more specific, for instance, in, the, in this double box, you would find at the end that there's two master intervals and all the rest of the integrand function space can be filled with, with surface terms. And most of these uh, sets of propagator, propagators would actually have no master integrator, intervals associated with, uh, with them. Um, another comment is that these IBP generating vectors are power counting or theory independent. So this means that once you've uh, determined them for a given theory, you can just reuse them for another calculation. For instance, we have already determined the, the planar ones because we did the, the, the uh, four gluon planar QCD calculation. And so we had these IBP generating vectors, we could reuse them for the gravity calculation. And we only had to uh, get IBP generating vectors for the non-planar uh, uh, sectors here. So once you have the surface terms, you, uh, you have a, an explicit analytic decomposition of your integrand into master, in, into master integrals and, and surface terms. So you have, you have a decomposition of the amplitude in this form, sorry, in this form here, where, uh, where these coefficients are 
are um, unknown. So the, the rest of the calculations about determining these coefficients. Uh, for this, as I already said, we use uh, generalized unitarity. The idea is that when you probe the integrand into specific uh, on-shell configurations of the loop momentum, um, the integrand factorizes. So the, this is what's said in this uh, equation. Here on the left-hand side, you just have a product of, of trees. And on the right-hand side, you have a combination of these, uh, uh, of these coefficients that you're trying to, to, to determine. So this, this equation becomes a, a set of uh, linear equations for the coefficients that you're trying to, to determine. Um, a point that also Emil uh, highlighted in his talk is that if you do the calculation in this way, these are really physical tree amplitudes, so you don't have any issues with ghosts or any unphysical states propagating in your, in your um, internal uh, loops. So, for instance, if you're looking at the double box uh, topology, you, put, you go to a configuration where all the propagators are put on shell, and then you just need to multiply it together, and you have a sum over the states where in the connections here. Um, but these are really physical uh, trees. So essentially, you've reduced the problem to an efficient computation of, uh, of tree amplitude. And this is where our calculation becomes numerical, because we use a uh, band scalar recursion to to evaluate these trees, these, these tree amplitudes uh, very efficiently. Um, this the sum over the states is done in ds dimensions, and but because we're doing a numerical calculation, we need to uh, specify a given value for ds. So we choose the values uh, six through ten, uh, as as will become clear in the next slide. We need to compute that uh, five different values of ds, and. Um, and the most complicated tree level amplitude we need to evaluate is uh, a five point uh, tree amplitude, which appears in the, in the sunrise uh, gut. And then, so once you've built the set of equations here, uh, you solve these equations numerically, and this avoids the construction of, a, of an analytic integral. And once you've done this, as I said, the integration step is simply setting to zero, to zero the, the surface terms. So by, by through this procedure, you, you, can act, you can compute the amplitude at the numerical phase space pointer for a numerical value of ds and, and the dimensional regulator. Okay, but as I also said, we, what we want is to use this to get numerics. So let me now explain how we go from numerics to analytics. Um, so let me describe variables these coefficients depend. So they depend on your dimensional regulator, they depend on ds. They depend on, and then they depend on the kinematic data, so S and X. So S, uh, I choose to, to have a dimensionful variable S, uh, which is just a Mandelstam variable, and then X, which is a dimensionless variable. Um, okay, and the, these coefficients uh, have a rational dependence on all these variables. And so it's natural to do this calculation in a finite field where you only work, use rational numbers that you uh, project into a finite field. And so you only, find, you only have integers in the finite field. And the advantage of doing this is that you, there's no loss of precision in, the, in any numerical map, uh, manipulations. So it's a very efficient way to do this calculation where you don't need to worry about losing precision in a numerical calculation. Um, okay, so now let's discuss the analytic uh, epsilon dependence, so the, de the dependence on the dimensional uh, regulator. So this function is a rational function of epsilon, and it's clear to everyone that if I compute a rational function at enough values, uh, I can actually determine the function once and for all. This, this uh, one way to do this is through a uh, Tillis formula. And this is what we do. So we just take this, we, we fix all the, all the other variables. So the S, S and X, we fix it to some values and we compute that enough values to determine the, the, the full the, the analytic dependence on, on epsilon. Um, okay, so now we know how it depends on epsilon. The next question is how it depends on the S. And for this, you can actually use some uh, a priori knowledge. So you know that the einstein hilbert is at most a quadratic polynomial. So that's why you need to evaluate at five different values of the S that allows you to fix, to completely fix this quadratic, uh, this quartic polynomial. And the gauss bonnet contributions are, are actually a cubic polynomial over the S minus two, and, but it, that vanishes at the S, at the S equals four. So, so it's actually, a, a, it looks a bit more complicated, but it's actually a simple problem to solve. Um, anyway, the idea is the same, is that you probe the, these coefficients at enough values of the S that, so that you can reconstruct the full analytic DS dependence. So at the end of this process, you have analytic epsilon and ds dependence at the numerical uh, phase space point. Okay, the next step is obvious, is to determine the dependence on the kinematic uh, data, the uh, s and x. So we could in principle, in principle follow the same procedure because, um, so first of all, the s dependence is trivial, is you, you just get it by dimensional analysis, so, so that one I will not discuss, but the x dependence is the complicated one. 
And uh, it, you could, in principle, use the same procedure that we used for the epsilon dependence. You just have a rational function in x, so you can use still as formula to determine the x dependence. But it turns out that it's a bit more complicated, the x dependence. And uh, one of the reasons is that in the two-loop calculation, we have a lot of um, uh, lower loop information that is uh, mixed in. And so our first step is to, instead of reconstructing the full uh, two-loop calculation, we, we just target the genuine, the genuine two-loop contribution. And to do this, uh, we don't reconstruct the, the amplitude, but we reconstruct the remainder, and then you know how to go back to the amplitude. So for this, we first set the S equals to four minus two epsilon. Uh, we removed we remove all the soft, so there's only soft uh, singularities. Uh, there's no collinear in gravity, so we, we remove the soft with this uh, soft factor. And uh, the amplitude is UV finite by construction because we're working in the uh, effective field theory. And so by, by doing this, we have a finite remainder that is independent of, of epsilon. The price to pay is that this decomposition into master integral is no longer valid because I'm mixing together two loop amplitudes and one loop amplitudes, so they have different phases of master intervals, but it's, I can instead decompose into a set of uh, a special functions. So this, this would be logarithms or dialogarithms or things like that. And, uh, but the, the, this decomposition is very similar to this one in the sense that these coefficients here, the di, are just rational functions of, of, uh, of x. And what we actually uh, uh, reconstruct in the end is these di coefficients. And by doing that, we have uh, computed uh, an analytic amplitude just from enough numerical uh, data. So the algorithm is clear, and uh, and we have implemented this uh, full framework in Caraval that, as I said already, will be released soon. And um, and we've already tested this in QCD calculations before. In particular, we got the analytic uh, result expressions for planar for all planar five parton amplitudes, which is kinematically a more complicated problem than than this uh, uh, for graviton amplitudes. Uh, so there, there we, we had to do some new developments for this uh, for this calculation. We had to uh, be able to we had to be able to handle uh, non-planar topologies. Um, we had to introduce the Feynman rules for the Gauss Bonnet and the R cubed uh, counterterms, and also for the einstein hilbert And for this, we used the the the, the cubic interaction reformulation um, uh, uh, found by by these people. And the, the advantage of this is that we can we can generate. Uh, tree amplitude of any multiplicity without having to more more Feynman rules. And uh, once we have done all of this through only uh, 20 numerical evaluations, by which I mean 20 evaluations at uh, evaluations at 20 different phase space points, uh, phase space points, we can actually reconstruct the the, the full uh, set of uh, uh, two loop uh, for graviton amplitudes. So uh, by this I mean these three independent helicity uh, configurations. Okay, so uh, again, the, for, so we computed the three independent helicities for all these. Uh, type of of, uh, of contributions to the effective field theory, so that's the uh, squared um, the, the two loop uh, Einstein Hilbert uh, gravity, a, a tree level um, amplitude with a single R cubed insertion, a tree level with a double Gauss Bonnet insertion, and a one loop with a single Gauss Bonnet insertion. Uh, we we did some checks on our result, so our first. Uh, internal consistency check we can make is that what we think should be finite, so the remainders are indeed finite if you put the, the, all the ingredients together in the, in the right way, that the, the remainders have the right uh, symmetry. For instance, the whole plus should be symmetric under ST and U exchanges. Uh, and that, for instance, you don't get any spurious poles when, into, when you're going to specific limits, say when S goes to zero, that the amplitude behaves as, uh, as expected. Uh, the one loop amplitudes were also known, so we we, we actually re recomputed all the one loop amplitudes because we needed to extend them to order uh, epsilon squared. So so we recomputed re the one loop amplitudes and we matched known results. And here I should thank uh, these people for sharing with us some unpublished uh, results. Uh, for the counter terms, so some of the counter terms were actually already known. So the Gauss Bonnet tree and one loop for these elicities was known, um, and also the same thing for the R cubed uh, tree amplitudes. And finally, the two loop all plus amplitude was known as well. So this was a strong check that we were actually computing the right uh, objects. So let's have a quick look at the, the results. So there's three uh, independent helicities. Uh, of course, the, as usual, the, the, the all plus is the simplest. And if you look at the remainder, you get a, a functions up to weight one. So you only get logarithms. And as expected, it's symmetric under S, T, and U. I gave here the, the expression for the remainder is very compact, so, so I, I can write it here in the, in the, in the slide. 
uh, when you go to the single minus, you see the, the behavior that you see also in QCD, which is that the remainder is now uh, weight two. You only have logs, so, and it's also symmetric under ST and U exchanges. Um, and finally, when you go to the, to the minus minus plus plus configuration, now you get the full uh, set of functions that you would think you should get. So you go up to weight four, this is what you would expect in a tool calculation. And you see also uh, classical polylogarithms that appear in the remainder. So here I quote, I, uh, the, 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 full, the full expression for the remainder is too large to put on a slide, but so here I only quote the expression in a given uh, kinematic limit in the, this S channel uh, regular limit. Um, which, because it, this is this was the result that uh, uh, Julio uh, referenced in his talk, so so this is a result that 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 has some practical uh, implications. Okay, so now uh, once we had computed these uh, these remainders, we, we we looked at them and we tried to understand how they how they depend on 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 the couplings and and how they depend on the renormalization scale. So just let me remind you that we work in a, an effective field theory. So we had to introduce two new couplings, one associated with the gauss bonnet counter terms and one associated with the r cubed counter terms. So these couplings, of course, have a pole. Yeah, they need to have a pole because they need to, to cancel some UV uh, poles in the uh, einstein hilbert amplitude. And then they have some finite part that, uh, that you're free to, to, to set to, that is undetermined. <laughs> And uh, it's interesting that the remainders depend, they don't depend individually on these two couplings, but across all the elicities, they depend in a single uh, combination of the couplings, in particular this combination here. So I wrote here the, the dependence explicitly for the all plus, you have this 30 times uh, C mu, for the single minus, you have three times C mu, and the uh, uh, MMPP uh, is actually independent of C mu. And uh, so th this, uh, this observation is valid for these elicities, but it also seems to seem to hold for a uh, five point to loop all plus that was computed by uh, these people. Uh, uh, another perspective on, on the same um, point is the, is, the, is, the, is the mu dependence of the remainder. So, and this, this was already explored in these papers. Um, so if you compute the mu dependence of the remainder, you find that, and this was done for the old plus in this paper, you find that it satisfies this formula where you have here the, the only the R cubed uh, tree amplitude. And in fact, this formula actually holds for uh, all the elicities. In particular for the MPP, it actually tells you that the remainder is, is, independent, is, is independent of the renormalization uh, scale mu because the, the, the tree level R cubed amplitude vanishes. Um, our perspective on this is that this is so in particular the fact that uh, you only have uh, you only seem to have one particular contribution of these couplings that is relevant is that uh, the gauss bonnet counter term is evanescent and we know that there are uh, strange things that happen with this uh, type of counter terms and I refer you here to uh, Swiss talk uh, earlier in the in the week. Uh, so that brings me to my summary. So. I think we, we now we know that to loop numerical unitarity is a very mature framework. Um, it's, very, it's a very efficient approach to obtaining uh, analytic results and it's generic. So we did, with it, we were able to obtain both state of the art results in QCD and uh, gravity. Um, so we use it to, to compute a full set of four gravity analytic amplitudes. We confirmed the known all plus uh, amplitudes and we, uh, and, we, and we found new results for single minus and uh, minus minus plus plus. Uh, this calculation already led to new insights into the relation between uh, multi-loop amplitudes and classical gravitational dynamics. And here I refer you to, to, to this paper and to Julius' talk. And uh, we also uh, found some, or uh, extended some interesting perspective on, on the couplings and the mu dependence of the, uh, of the, of the remainders. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Samuel.